Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. It's really great to share this space with you, this virtual space with you anyway. Um, welcome to today's webinar um, that's going to be exploring feminist agroecologies. We're very pleased and we're excited to be joined by our speakers today, um, Tiffany Traverse from Four Sisters Farm, Julia Nawira Kamau from the Seed Savers Network of Kenya, and Leonida Ndongo from Hakinawira, Africa. Um, my name is Martha Stegman. I'm an assistant professor here at York in the Faculty of Environmental and Urban Change. And along with my colleagues, Leticia Amadiawuo, who's the executive director at Seed Change, and Beatrice Oliver, who's the director of international programs at Sea Change, I'm very happy to welcome you to today's event. York University acknowledges its presence on the traditional territory of many Indigenous nations. The area that's known as Tuckeronto has been caretaken by the Anishinaabek Nation, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, and the Huron Wendat, and is now home to many First Nation, Inuit, and Metis communities. We acknowledge the current treaty holders, the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation, and we also acknowledge that this territory is subject of the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, the 1764 Treaty of Niagara and Silver Covenant Chain, and a network of treaty agreements that leave Torontonians with responsibilities and obligations to not only care for these lands, but to respect the authority, jurisdiction, and knowledge systems of the Indigenous nations whose lands we occupy here in so-called Canada and to align our work with the anti-colonial struggles around the world, such as those that Julia and Leonida will be speaking to today. It's always great to know who's in the room, who's in the virtual room. So I'd like to all, and to encourage all of you to please, please use the chat, check in, say hello to us, tell us where you're joining us from and whose indigenous territory you're joining us from too as well. Today's event and what country, because I know we have people from all around the world. Um, we have Tiffany, who for whom it's the morning. We have Julia and Leonida, for whom it's the evening. And I'm sure uh, all time zones in between are represented. Today's event is the last of four webinars that have been held over the winter term as part of the Faculty of Environmental and Urban Changes annual research seminar series. And we've been excited and honored to partner with Sea Change this year to bring you this series inspired by the global peasant movement Livia Campesina's rallying cry, Food Sovereignty Now. Throughout the series, we've been showcasing the work of indigenous, small farmer and peasant movements across Turtle Island and across the global south, working to strengthen traditional and agroecological food systems and to defend women, indigenous people and farmers' rights in the face of land grabbing, restrictive intellectual property regimes, and policies at national and international levels that are designed to support the expansion of corporate agribusiness. We opened the series in January with an inaugural panel that centered Indigenous perspectives on seed sovereignty. In February, we had an event that explored intellectual property, property regimes, seed laws, and farmers' rights. Earlier this month, we held a web webinar exploring the praxis of agroecology, and we'll drop a link in the chat that um, connects you with our with our YouTube channel, so you can check those conversations out if you missed them or if you want to revisit them. Today's event will explore feminist agroecologies and explore the contributions that, wem, that women, femme, and two-spirit farmers are making to the movement, the unique challenges they face, and what shifts in the broader food sovereignty movement we need to better support their efforts. And before I pass the mic over to you, Ama, I just want to say thank you to Rhoda Reyes, our research officer, and to Igor Lute for all of the hard work they've done behind the scenes to, to make this series happen. So over to you, Ama, and thank you so much, everybody, for joining us. Thank you so much, uh, Martha, and thanks, uh, everyone, for joining us uh, uh, for this uh, amazing uh, sessions. Um, greetings from Sea Change. Um, we are also very thrilled to collaborate with York University in this series. The main office of Sea Change is located on the traditional unceded territory of the Algonquin and Ashinaabe people. We acknowledge the injustice of the past and present and are committed to act in solidarity with the struggles of Indigenous people in so-called Canada and around the world against the occupation of the alliance and profit and power by brutal forces of colonization, white supremacy, and capitalism. Sea Change, uh, previously USC Canada, is uh, we are an international non-governmental organization that work with partners um, around the world on local seed systems and food sovereignty. 
I think it's 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 very timely that it's International Women's Liberations Month, and for this final. Um, uh, part of our series, we delve into feminist approaches to agroecology, featuring amazing women, seed guardians, and activists from Turtle Island and East Africa. We are very excited about our speakers, uh, Leonida Odongo, Tiffany Traves, and Julia Kamwa. We know that women farmers, particularly um, indigenous in indigenous communities, have a crucial role as food producers and seed gardens. We also know that there are numerous infringements on their rights. Um, women decision-making power is often restricted by patriarchal norms. For these reasons, more needs to be done, of course, to recognize and support women's leadership for agroecology and seed and food sovereignty. So I'll turn it over to my colleague, uh, Beatrice Oliver, to introduce our first speaker. Over to you, Bea. Thank you, my name is Beatrice and it's an honor for me to introduce Tiffany Traverse, our first speaker. Tiffany Traverse is a Sequoia Indigenous Seed and Land Steward at Four Sister Farms and a guest in the peace region of what is now known as BC on Treaty 8 territory, homeland of the Dene Zoc. The land she tends is home base for ongoing exploration of the relationships between seeds and heritage, history and self. She is a passionate indigenous researcher and land steward, land and seed steward, building collaborative approaches to community resiliency, emergency preparedness and prevention, and adaptation to change. Her advocacy work is around climate adaptation, indigenous led research and stewardship, indigenous sovereignty and security, and cultural and Thank you, Tiffany. Over to you. Yeah, thank you so much for that introduction. I'm very, very happy, honored, and grateful to be here um, sharing space with some incredible women and femmes. And uh, yeah, I'm just going to, I'm going to dive right in so that we have lots of uh, time at the end for um, questions and some conversation, because I think it's really important. Um, I have a short slide deck I'll share. Let's see if this is going to work. Mm -hmm. One minute. Okay. Okay. So, um, I'll start things off. Uh, White Book White F, Rusquest Re, Tiffany Traverse, Sequepmuk. Swiss ka slaka ta sequat makulu ta simk um eh um a kiskanuk eh kempeskit mutka ne treaty eight danaiza um I just introduced myself in my traditional sequat makshin language. Uh, my name is Tiffany Traverse. I'm a land and seed steward, Sequamuk, Swiss heritage, um, living now as a grateful guest in Treaty 8 territory. Um, and to give everyone some context on geographical location, I'm in about the northeast portion of, of what's now known as British Columbia in so-called Canada. Um, a little bit about me. Um, I've, I've spoken a, a few different times in different realms. Um, I'm a land and seed steward. I'm an indigenous researcher. Um, I highly advocate um, for cultural burning, as well as emergency preparedness uh, in rural and Indigenous communities. Uh, I'm a baby language learner, so I'm, I'm just actually um, relearning my Sequetmux Gene language, um, and that in itself has been a, a difficult journey, um, having languages taken from us and then reclaiming these as part of our uh, cultural connection to land um, has definitely been a very heartful, but um, difficult journey. So any chance I get, I try to speak my language when I can. Um, and I'm an auntie uh, to many different people, um, to my little nephews in, in what's now known as California, but also to many other people who are now looking to me um, to share knowledge and to have that transfer of energy and knowledge shared. 
And so I'm going to dive right in here on some of the systemic problems um, that that we as Sequemic people have faced um, here in so-called Canada. And of course, I'm speaking from um, a very personal context of of what it means to be a femme presenting person in the world of, you know, of agriculture and um, what I like to call uh, basically our post-apocalyptic world that we're living in right now as Indigenous peoples in so-called Canada. So a few, just a few of the, the issues that we've faced um, as Sequemic people, the systemic problems, um, of course, uh, very, um, very real and happening in real time as well, whether that's colonization. So uh, the church and impo imposed norms, and I'll get into that in a little bit here, um, dissolved family units and the dispossession of our land and our culture. Um, and also capitalism, which also just this kind of feeds into um, basically what's happening with our loss of, of self space and biodiversity. Um, the greed that happens with the um, uh, industrial agricultural complex, um, you know, being left from any type of decision making um, as women and femmes and indigenous peoples as a whole. Um, and the commodification of our seeds and food basically all, all lending into that capitalistic structure, um, which leads us to our loss of self and biodiversity. So um, my family was actually um, sent to residential institutions. So uh, like we, as Sequim people living today, and, and especially myself coming from my personal context, are residential institution survivors, uh, and with that, of course, comes our loss of language and the fracturing of our ancestral foodways. And just to give a, a bit of a background on, um, on us as Sequemuk people, we were non-agrarian. Um, we were actually semi-nomadic. We would follow the migration patterns of the ungulates, um, the fish, the salmon, which are now no longer in our territory, um, and berries and roots. And so we would live in our, um, you know, our, our brush mat houses or teepees during the summer months. And then in the winter, we would actually live in kukuli or, or pit houses. So we would actually dig um, earthen structures that we would live in through the winter months. And to give you an idea of kind of what happened um, uh, during this time of, of colonization um, and, and as it was happening in real time and how we were adapting to what what happened. Uh, basically the, the CPR, the rail line was punched straight through our territory, right along the Columbia River, what's now known as the Columbia River, the Setequa. Um, and we actually had to take up farming, being pushed from our lands onto small reserves. We actually um, took up farming as a means to feed ourselves and also to feed um, many of the Chinese rail workers that were, that were forced to work um, as the CPR lines were put in. And with that came the adaptation uh, to different things, whether that was in invasive species monitoring, um, you know, the rail line did bring in what I believe now reading some of the stories was likely canola um, and possibly other um, brassica species uh, that actually invaded much of our lands. Uh, and also our, we have and had, um, you know, very complex and, uh, robust systems to bring, you know, whether that was water, so the, the fluming system bringing water from um, the river, as well as cultural and prescribed burning um, that again, once we were forced on onto the reserves, we weren't allowed to do anymore. Um, and basically there's stories of, you know, my great grandmother and her grandparents burning the sloughs right before the birds would set their nests so they could drive out the pests and make for nice clean ground for the ducks to lay their eggs. And then we would actually collect, um, ethically harvest some of those eggs as part of our uh, main food source. We actually didn't raise any um, livestock at that time. Obviously, later on, we did start, um, you know, raising milk cows and, um, and chickens. And with that was also our, our very robust seed saving, indigenous plant breeding and sharing of um, plant seeds and food. And my family actually were uh, very um, 
avid dog and horse trainers. So we would actually train um, pack horses, uh, race horses, actually, because there was a, a huge um, uh, indigenous racing circuit that happened. So we would actually race horses as well in our traditional ways. And I'm just going to read a small story um, from my gra from my grandmother's book, um, and it really drives uh, the work that I'm doing um, here at our farm. So I do a lot of plant breeding for adaptation, as was mentioned in the in the opening. Um, being in a in a territory that is not my home, um, I've had to adapt, and that's basically what we as Indigenous and Sokwapa people have had to do um, through this like I said, post-apocalyptic world, um, post, you know, colonization, late, late stage um, capitalism is, is basically what it is. Um, I'm just going to read a, a small story from uh, my great-grandmother's book. And really, this is exactly what drives um, my wanting to take up space as a femme-presenting person in the world of agriculture. What they fed us. Terrible, unbelievable. We had the same things for years. The buns, when you split them, were full of mouse droppings. Still to this day, I cannot eat bread or buns with black seeds of any kind in them. Everything was full of droppings, the flour, cereals, etc. There was always cat pee in the kitchen too. You could smell it all the time, even in the food, especially in the bread. It was disgusting. Our drink was a cocktail made up from the leftovers from the priests, sisters, and the handyman's dining room. It was teas and coffees diluted with water. For lunch or evening meals, we had bread, maybe stew or thick barley, sometimes sliced boiled beef and potatoes, and we also ate a lot of turnips. If we were lucky, sometimes we'd get a mulligan made up of leftovers from the better dining room. We had one egg at Easter and one orange at Christmas. Sour stew or stew gone bad. I've seen it on the kitchen floor bubbling and boiling without heat. We'd have to eat these things when we had porridge with the mouse droppings. There was no sugar, no milk. Even though the boys looked after cattle, we got no milk. Even, oh, uh, if you did not eat your meal, you got it for the next one. During recess, they'd give us snacks, they called it. There was a back door with a platform behind the school and they would come out there with a basket of crusts from bread and throw it at us. We'd be like chickens running around trying to get a piece. We'd have to pick it up off the ground if you weren't lucky enough to catch it in the air. And there's many stories like this uh, from my grandmother um, and all of her sisters had to go to residential institutions. Uh, and just the fact that once, you know, they were sick and they had these like oozing sores all over their bodies, you know, once they were able to go home and eat our traditional foods, um, they would start healing and it would, it would really heal their bodies. Um, and I mentioned before talking about the fracturing of um, family units and having the church come in. So you know, to give everyone an idea, um, we as Sequetmuk actually have more of like a, um, it's more of a patriarchal structure and not matriarchal, um, but in a different sense, like using that word now feels very strange because it, it is a very bad connotation. Um, but our family structures were based around, um, it was typically, you know, a man of the household and, and they would have two wives and two full families that all work together as a large family unit. Um, so basically um, ethical non-monogamy. And when the church came in, this was wrong. You know, God would not like that. You know, God thinks this is wrong. You know, you are sinners. And, um, and basically we were forced to decide um, you know, the men of the family were forced to decide which wife and which children and, and which family they would um, continue on with. So that in itself was a huge fracturing of our family units, um, splitting up entire families and entire communities. Um, and just knowing that, you know, women played this, the most important role, I would say, in the household, um, you know, whether that was you know, cooking, harvesting, you know, the kids would go out and, and harvest with, um, with the women, they would come in behind and, and replant the small bulbs of the roots. All of these things, you know, were part of our, our larger system um, that really meant uh, a holistic approach to, to food is what it is. And so, 
what drives my work um, and a lot of the research that I'm doing is to reestablish um, not only these ancestral foodways um, that I'm reclaiming for myself, whether it's Sukkot Mok, Swiss, you know, I'm trying to bring these seeds back into my life and and grow them and share them and and have, you know, my nephews and, and others feel and, and taste these foods again. We women and femme presenting people, gender non, you know, non-conforming um, to spirit people, um, we were the ones that were the caretakers of, of food and seed. And so I just had this slide up here for looking towards the future of um, our cultural re revitalization is happening here and now. And it is like absolutely led by women, um, two spirit, gender fluid, non-conforming individuals and communities. Um, you can look anywhere and a lot of these practices are being um, reclaimed um, by women and femmes. And I just wanted to throw up this slide as well for a little shout out to um, a few projects uh, to look out for. So Indigenous Food and Freedom School, and that's headed up by Don Morrison. Indigenous Climate Actions, Decolonizing Climate Policy. I'm, I've been part of their advocacy and, and advisory work for quite some time. Um, again, Indigenous people being left um, from any decision making in, in climate policy. And so this is the work that we're having to do to go back um, and make that right. Uh, Women in Fire Training Exchange. So uh, WTREX is an amazing program that's uh, run all across Turtle Island. I think they're actually in um, South Africa right now doing a program um, where they're bringing in women, uh, femmes, two-spirit uh, people and femme presenting people um, to, to reclaim um, cultural burning practices. And I, I feel that that's a, a big piece of the picture that's missing in a lot of our food related work um, all over the world. And so I'm really excited um, about that program um, as well. The Rare Collective, uh, which looks at uh, rematriation uh, work that's going on. And also Women Who Dig. Um, and this is a, just a little shout out to a project that I'm working on uh, with my friend, author Trina Moyles um, from her book, Women Who Dig, Farming Feminism and the Fight to Feed the World, where she traveled all over the world, speaking to women and femmes and uh, getting an idea and a sense of the the disparities that they're facing whether that's access to land and capital um you know industry that's a big one um up here actually in the northeast is is industry um encroaching on arable land uh, and we're actually doing a film adaptation so i have a short video and i'm hoping it's going to play it's kind of our sizzler reel um with uh, the film being taken on by um my friend anna so I'm gonna see if this is gonna play for us. How am I feeling? Oh, I'm always anxious. <laughs> yeah. It's not supposed to happen this fast either. I mean, they were saying, you know, uh, 30 to 50 years, but I think things are happening a lot faster than people um, first anticipated. So I've just seen like the changes that are happening like right here I can see them like it's such a you know macro level so this kind of variety of growing kind of confuses some people right who are used to order like no we're not a colonial garden this is a free, free people garden. Uh, orchid beans are, they're kind of all over the place, but these are a strain from uh, Sep Sepapank Elder in BC. Um, Wolverine William McNass, and he was a seed advocate for his community, so we grow this particular strain to, to uh, support the community. So just slowly starting to get to know beans, <laughs> and trying to grow them and kind of harvest them respectfully and learn how to keep them and learn how to build up the populations in our garden and get to the point where we can start passing seeds around to our community.
Yeah, so I hope everyone was able to see that and hear it. I know it might have been a little bit choppy, um, but yeah, that's a project that's coming up, um, which focuses on uh, BIPOC farmers and FEMS um, in so-called Canada. Uh, and it's been really lovely to um, to be able to do some filming and speaking throughout the entire season um, uh, and just see the kind of the seasonal changes and, and kind of the work that we do throughout the year. Uh, and yeah, that, that's it for me for my presentation. I'm leaving you here with, um, I just actually found this today by Aubrey Blanche, um, this uh, kind of quote here. Marginalized people don't need more mentors or more advice. They need sponsors who are willing to bend power structures and open doors to let us use our wisdom and brilliance. And I thought that was just such a nice way to, to end this as a kind of a call to action, um, you know, if you know there's people in different different structures, whether it's academia, um, you know, different institutions, um, governments, you know, basically, yes, we do need our mentors and our mentorship and mentees, actually. Um, but what a lot of people are saying is we really just need, you know, accomplices and allies to to really help with that bending of power structures and to open the doors for us to do this work. Good catch up. Thank you so much for that, Tiffany. It's really exciting to see some of you um, on the land holding seed um, and doing this work. Thank you for that um, really important reminder of the ways that settler colonialism has really, really disrupted with incredible violence the food systems of Indigenous people. Um, and this inspiring portrait that you're sharing with us of the way that women and Two-Spirit and Femme growers are really revitalizing these connections with land through language and, and culture. So thank you for that. Um, our second speaker is Leonida Ondongo, who's a Kenyan social justice activist with vast experience in grassroots organizing, advocacy, and adult learning methodologies. Leonida holds a bachelor's degree in political science and sociology from the University of Nairobi, and is currently undertaking a master's in international conflict management. She nurtures university students on human rights and social justice in universities in Kenya, Uganda, and Tanzania. Leonida has a passion for working with grassroots communities on food and climate justice with rural women and youth, and has coordinated Eastern and Southern Africa region on behalf of IBOM International, focusing on climate justice, food justice, and civil society development effectiveness. A freelance writer amplifying community experiences Leonida's articles have featured on Black Agenda Report, Hambazuka News, Third World Network, and World Pulse, a global online women's network representing 220 countries. Leonida is also a coordinator of the Seed Working Group at the Alliance for Food Sovereignty in Africa, as well as a member of the Climate Action Group. Um, so Leonida, over to you. We're just so grateful that you're, that you're joining us today. Uh, thank you very much. I'd like her to request Amma to share my presentation. I sent her on WhatsApp. I managed to send it via WhatsApp. Uh, my topic is women and the politics of seed. And uh, as you all know, politics is who gets what, when and how. It's also the authoritative allocation of resources and values. Food is political. And uh, in my country, Kenya, and also in South Africa, there are demonstrations, particularly on rising cost of living, and central to this was the rising cost of food. As a continent, we've suffered, especially uh, because of the war in Ukraine. Uh, food has become very expensive because we import a lot of our grain from Ukraine. The price of oil has gone up. Women who are doing uh, petty businesses, for example, uh, selling uh, potato chips by the roadside can no longer do their work because of this. And uh, the other thing I want to say is that in the conversations around seed, especially in the African continent, we have to trace our food from slavery and link Africans in Africa and the diaspora. What I want to point out is that uh, during slavery, as Africans, we didn't get chance when we were being captured. We never got chances to prepare well. Many a times, you could get captured. For example, you go to fetch firewood, and then you get uh, captured, taken into a ship, 
never to come back home again. Sorry. Uh, no worries, Yonita. We can hear you, but um, I just wanted to say I didn't get it at all. I didn't get your on presentation. On WhatsApp? Even on, on WhatsApp? WhatsApp? Yeah, I'm so sorry. Oh. It's I okay. Know. I'll just... Uh, it's okay. I'll just make the presentation and then I'm going to share the... Okay. It's not showing on your WhatsApp. That's... Mm. <laughs> okay. For whatever odd okay. reason. No, no worries about that at all. And we can hear you nice and clear. Yeah, I think, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah it's loading, it's loading, but it's coming. But I can it's loading, hear. okay. <laughs> all right, okay. Yeah, right. I think it's loading, sorry. Uh, and so uh, with the seeds, what used to happen is that women could put seeds in their hair and tie, and tie the hair. And when captured, they could actually go with the seeds. And of course, during slavery, uh, there was no uh, adequate food for survival for the fetus, and if you're lucky enough to reach the plantations where you went to, you still had to survive with almost lack of food because slaves were supposed to work. Slavery was not luxury. And all this information, you can look at a book called Black Rice. It's been written uh, by a professor from uh, California University. And of course, as an African, Cornrows are very important for us. They actually escape route. There are also places where we could put seeds. For example, I can give, I have a plate here. It has uh, seeds, you can see them. Yeah. These are seeds, indigenous seeds that have disappeared. They can actually fit in my hair. And if I'm able to plate it, depending on how long my hair is, I can actually carry different in my hair. Our woolly type of hair as Africans was actually a way of survival uh, during uh, slavery. Uh, what I want to also share is um, that within our continent, we're having a lot of uh, seed related uh, criminalization of use of indigenous seeds. And this is coupled especially with uh, multinational corporations who even interfere with our legislation. Recently, there was a call for harmonization of seed laws within the African continent being done by the African Union. And as you know, if a decision is made by the African Union, it's going to cascade through all regions of Africa. What do I mean when I, talk about, when I say harmonization of seed laws? Basically, it's having almost similar legislation across countries. And these legislations have what we call punitive clauses. For example, if I talk about our seed laws in Kenya, we have the Crops Act and we have the Seed, seed Act. These two acts have punitive clauses in them where farmers are not allowed to exchange indigenous seeds. It's criminalized. They're also calling for having uh, seed inspectors who can come to your farm and inspect where your seeds come from. And of course, we've all heard of, uh, we all know about patents and the negative impact of patents, especially in food production, because patents are normally from 20 to 25 years, and that means that farmers have to pay royalty. And for example, the kind of farmers that we work with or we have in Africa, some of them do not even own the land that they are killing. They've leased this land from other people. And so imagine charging a farmer a million Kenya shillings is quite expensive and is quite abnormal. And yet, these policymakers are operating and talking about criminalization of seeds in a context where we say that 70 to 80 percent of Africans are smallholder farmers, and 70 to 80 percent of the proceeds of our GDP come from farming. And of course, half the half the number of women in Africa, half the population in Africa, almost 330 million people, are smallholder farmers who depend on food. So what I can say is that there are contradictions as far as our legislations are concerned in the continent, but of course we are seeing a push by the multinational corporations. And one good example is uh, the uh, one good example, for instance, is the Bill Gates Foundation and the inroads that uh, he's making into the continent. 
For example, we're having uh, the push for genetically modified organisms in a country like Kenya. We had a 10-year ban on uh, importation of genetically modified organisms, but now there is a push to lift that ban. In fact, we have a case in court, and that means that uh, we are going to be uh, importing genetically modified organisms, and of course, there's going to be more uh, field trials and uh, some of the crops that are going to be targeted are, for example, cassava. We already have GM cassava in Kenya. Other crops are maize, and as we all know, maize is a staple food that is eaten throughout across many uh, countries, especially in East Africa. And if I look at, uh, for instance, I talk about the techno fixes in our food system, we find that uh, the techno fixes, of course, there is the push for contractual farming. We are told that our farms are not large enough to produce food. And we are forced to produce what we don't consume. For example, in Kenya, there are thousands of acres of tea plantation. The question is, do we consume all that tea? If you do a comparative analysis between uh, the workers in the tea plantation and how much money is spent, for example, uh, if I talk about the coffee farm, how much uh, somebody pays for the same coffee in a Java cafe is quite high, but the farmer who toils on the land does not get an equivalent. The farmer who toils the land cannot even afford to go to Java and sit down and even smell that aroma of the coffee that he is producing. We talk about, for instance, uh, uh, Switzerland producing the best chocolate in the world. I have a question for the audience. How many uh, cocoa bushes does Switzerland own? Perhaps that's something that we need to think about. How many Cocoa farmers in Ghana can afford to eat those chocolates. So when we talk about the divide that's happening to the African continent, those are some of the realities of the food producers, majority of whom are women in our continent. The other uh, challenges of technophysics, of course, is increased monoculture, the push for fertilizer. Many farmers suffered when the war in Ukraine started because of overdependence on chemical fertilizer that is imported. Africans were using uh, manure to produce food, but now what's happening is that uh, the dominant narrative that your soil is denatured, your soil does not have nutrients, you have to use more fertilizer, that makes farmers to overdepend on importation, on imported fertilizers, which is expensive. And that's part of the reason why we are pushing for agroecology a food production process that works in tandem with the environment that is cheap and where farmers rely on what's locally available for them. The other things that are coming as far as um, uh, the other uh, areas that I can say are a challenge is that Africa is becoming the newest market for tea. As far as, uh, for example, uh, products are concerned. Yes, we are primary producers in the, in the international market, but we are forced to import. We are forced to import the very same products that, that have come from our continent. And for this, we can also blame the, the trade regime within the uh, WTO system, of which some countries are conditioned to be producers of primary products. And if you look at the value chain, you find that uh, if you produce primary products, of course, you don't have a lot of money. Uh, the other thing I'd like to talk about, uh, for example, is uh, culture and seeds and links this to women. In Africa, food is cultural, food is life. Food is a connector. During marriages, food is prepared. And where does this food come from? It comes from seeds. When you get married, you are always given seeds as a symbol of continuity, as a symbol of starting a new life. Women, for example, uh, uh, when they work on seeds, when they save seeds, and when they grow crops, they are actually promoting biodiversity. If you visit any African farm, you'll find that a woman does not have only one crop. She'll have vegetables, different types of indigenous vegetables. She's going to have maize, sweet potatoes, cassava. She's aware that if one crop fails, she can actually get food from the other crop. And of course, women are, are the custodians of nutrition within our home as Africans. Many a times, if you do an, if you do an analysis, if there's no food in the house, everyone goes to the mother. Nobody goes to ask food from their father. That really tells you the centrality of women as far as food is concerned. 
Ama perhaps you can check whether it has come now. Because I just wanted to share a few of the photos. On it has, how it has we are come, doing. but I think it's in a different format. So it may take just a little longer to get it okay. converted in here. So my apologies. All right. Okay, then you'll share afterwards. Yeah, and, and yes, yeah, if it's okay, I can we can share it um with the group. Yeah, after. Okay, okay, and uh, of course, women have also been participating in uh, domesticating different seeds, and this they do through trial and error on their farms. What I want to say is that uh, farms are actually labs, and farmers have been scientists all their life, practicing on their laboratory, which is their farm. And uh, when I bring out uh, the aspects of corporate capture of our food systems and link that with seeds and policies, we see a lot of uh, push for data. There's a lot of data looting where farmers are forced to, they're told you have to register, tell, you have to give us details about your farm so that you get any form of government support. There's also the push for synthetic food. A country like South Africa, they have cultured meat made in the lab. The question is, how good is that meat for you? Of course, there's a push targeting young people, and this is through the agribusinesses, where they are told that you need to grow food in order to sell. We have incidences where farmers are selling all the food in the market, and they end up going back to the market to buy the same food at abnormal prices. The disappearance of granary is another challenge in the continent. We are told to modernize. We are told to look uh, like people in Europe, and so people are no longer having granary. In the past, uh, if you ever went to an African homestead, you could always find a granary. But right now, you can go to someone's house and even leave, even stay there even for three hours and live without food. Why? Because there's no food and because granaries have been demonized. Uh, could you show the first, uh, the fifth slide, the first slide, please? I'll try to move a bit faster, but part of, of the things I've already uh, covered in the conversation. Yes, so, uh, so this slide actually shows the impact of techno fixes. Uh, the picture we have there is all African problems in one page, or all, all African problems in one photo. Of course, we also have issues of intellectual property and biopiracy, because when, for example, where do they get these seeds, the original seeds that they use in the lab? They get them from our farm. They go and take them to the lab, modify them, and then come back and sell us the same, same seeds with intellectual property of between 20 to 25 years, where farmers are forced to pay royalty. And this royalty is through having to buy seeds from the agrovet, and this is backed by law where there is criminalization of exchange of seeds and use of your own seeds. And of course, with this, uh, the push for industrial agriculture, there is obviously going to be a lot of land grabs already happening in the continent. We've had incidences where people, indigenous people are chased from their land at gunpoint. And this is happening, especially with the push to grab more and more of African uh, agriculture. Next slide, please. Uh, I just want to share some examples of what's happening in different communities. For example, you know, we all know that in West Africa, rice is the staple food. Uh, one example I've shown there is a community in uh, a place called Kasaman in Senegal. Where, we, where for them, rice has various uh, connotations, it has various values. It is eaten as food, it is used as sacrifice. When people plant, they do a lot of incantations. In Africa, we believe in mysticism, we believe in our ancestors, we believe that our ancestors, when they die, the spirit does not die. And that is why, for example, we find that people pay, like when people eat, before they eat, they pour the food to allow the ancestors to eat. We believe that when the ancestors are uh, angry, that's when we have drought, that's when we have crops that are failing, and that's when people go to the forest and the mountain with seeds and other forms of food to give to the ancestors to appease them. 
a country like Kenya, for example, we've had a drought, the harshest drought in 40 years since Kenya became an independent country. This is causing a lot of stress and a lot of trauma. People have lost life, and this is something that is very uh, irreversible. Move to the next slide, please. And uh, uh, when I link seed and culture, for example, in the African system, the traditional African system, seed was considered pure, and women who are um, of advanced age were the ones who are supposed to handle seed. If you are, for example, menstruating or giving birth, you are not supposed to handle seed because of the sanctity of seed. And uh, before uh, this other, other in, let's say, for example, in a home state, before any other person plants the seed, you'd find that the elderly women who are the first ones to do that. And for example, in a community like mine, which is called the Luo community, the first, the first wife, we are polygamous uh, community, the first wife, known as Nikai, was the one who would plant the first seed. This actually symbolizes the seniority, seniority and purity that is given to seed. Next slide, please. And of course, I already spoke about uh, the biodiversity and the different crops that uh, are planted. Next slide, please. And of course, with the biodiversity and different crops, it also means that soil is being taken care of. The soil is ensured to be healthy because when, when women plant their seeds, they ensure that they are planting different crops and some of them are nitrogen fixing, some of them are actually adding value and nutrients to the soil. Next slide, please. Uh, I already spoke some of the corporate capture of our seed, and I spoke about the legislation. I spoke about the push by scientists. We have a lot of scientists who are pushing, who are saying that GMO is a silver bullet to address our food insecurity. But they're not talking about addressing the root cause of the problem, which is, for example, uh, lack of water, lack of irrigation, because Africa has the most arable, 60% of Africa is arable, can produce food. So the question is, why should Africans go hungry in a continent that has enough sunshine, in a continent that have, has good soil? All this is being pushed by multinational corporations to come and steal not only the African heritage in terms of seed, but also African land in terms of soil. And of course, push the narrative that African soil is not healthy enough, and that's why we should use fertilizers. There's no agrovet who will ever tell you that the more fertilizers you use, the more it's going to kill the earthworms on your soil. There's no agrovet who will ever tell you that earthworms are important on your soil. Now farmers are being told to use Roundup. They are being, uh, you know, they are being lied to that if you use Roundup, you, it makes work easier for you. When in reality, Roundup has been banned in Europe, but you're finding it's finding its way in Africa. Does it mean that it's Africans who are fit, who are fit to eat chemical? And when you find, uh, for example, food that is being exported, you are told that some of it comes back at the airport. You're being told that it has high residue levels. And where, where does this chemical come from? It comes from Europe, it comes from uh, multinational corporations that cannot operate in their own countries because of stringent rules. They're coming to Africa where there is laxity, where our politicians don't care about what we eat. And as one politician in Kenya recently said, uh, when the, they were pushing for the GM coming to the country, he said that, uh, it was actually the, uh, the cabinet secretary for trade, he said that, uh, Kenyans have a lot of problems that add, uh, and can die anytime. So adding GM to the list of, of you know, potential <laughs> death problems is not an issue. So that really tells you how much politicians in Africa, as far as food is concerned, as far as our natural resources are concerned, they don't care about us. Next slide, please. And of course, uh, there's a push for biotech. We are told that biotech is a solution to our problem. Uh, just to share some of the, uh, just to show the power of, of uh, African women in relation to seed and linking uh, what we are doing on the ground. One is uh, organizing solidarity, 
sessions where we bring different uh, voices together. For example, uh, voices from Nigeria, an organization called Homes, Health of Mother Earth Foundation, voices from the Palestinian people, voices from Tunisia, just to bring in the centrality of food and discuss the different struggles that we go through, as well as chart uh, a solution. After sharing the experiences, we always look for what can we learn from each other. The other spaces, for example, that we use is the CSW, uh, the uh, Committee on Status of Women, and sharing uh, uh, our stories, for example, uh, the realities of the African continent. This is because many a times when we talk about food, uh, the realities, the negative impacts of transnational corporations that originate have their home, uh, home uh, bases in Europe and in the US, whatever they are doing in the African continent, many a times, the media does not tell this story. But also why we do, we amplify these, uh, 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 these things is that we try to dismantle the dominant narrative that African seeds are backward, African way of life is a cake. We are trying to actually show the world that within the African context, we are celebrating a lot of indigenous uh, food and natural food. And uh, we are also celebrating our indigenous culture and uh, the, the knowledge that we get from, from the elder people. Uh, the other thing that we've done as an organization is participating in the encountering uh, the UNFSS, UN Food System Summit. As this, what we did was to document community stories into videos and share, share them to counter uh, the corporate capture of our food systems. What came out was that there are more, many uh, multinational corporations, uh, agribusinesses that were pushing for for, for space. So for us, we felt that that is corporate takeover of our food systems. And as, as a continent, as Africa, we are the ones who are bound to suffer. Next slide, please. Uh, other strategies that we use, of course, is uh, participating in seed exchanges. The photo you see there is uh, uh, one photo that uh, was taken in Benin uh, last week, but one uh, that is in, uh, in a place called Potosome in Benin. And uh, there were 25 countries together. Majority of them were from West Africa. And uh, what I want to also say is that uh, in West Africa, at least their laws are not as stringent as what we have in East Africa. Because in West Africa, what you could see was that farmers could come from Burkina Faso, from Ghana, Senegal, and come and exchange their seeds with each other. That is something that cannot happen in East Africa. You will find that you have to come up, you have to have a certificate to cross the borders. And it's very, uh, very expensive to afford that certificate. So in actual sense, we actually curtail even to exchange our seeds with our brothers in, in the uh, greater Eastern Africa region. Other things that we do, we create spaces for feminist alternative debate. Uh, uh, the photo you can see there is uh, African women from different countries coming together to discuss food, sharing experiences, for example, of Tanzania, of Mozambique, of Sudan, and just sharing what, what is it that we can do together. We can do together as, as women. Next slide, please. I'm almost uh, done. And so uh, what are our key demands or what needs to be done? One, we need to have more similar spaces where we, we get opportunities to share our realities, opportunity to share our successes, how we are using agroecology, how we are saving our indigenous seeds, and how we are exchanging seeds amongst ourselves. And of course, also uh, the practices that we have, and, and this can be replicated even in other continents. Uh, this spaces also provide solidarity. For example, uh, when as Kenya, we had uh, uh, the push for lifting of the ban. Uh, spaces such as this can provide solidarity, especially bringing voices from other countries and experiences to challenge this. And uh, uh, the other uh, demand or request is for more funding to be uh, more funding and support because you find that many organizations, especially grassroots organizations, are really struggling. Sometimes to carry out activities at zero budget, which is not sustainable, and this is a big challenge. Sometimes you want to do capacity building for community members. You want to do trainings, for example, on feed saving because uh, the structural adjustment program. Agriculture was one of the sectors that was affected. We used to have uh, agricultural providers coming to farms to provide free services. But this has been cut. So what happens is that 
the existing agricultural extension services are marketers from uh, the multinational corporations. And what they do with the farmers, they come to sell their seeds. Uh, we also need uh, sessions where we can share and also uh, cross land from one another, and also spaces where, for example, we can have farmers coming from other parts of the world to learn from us and actually uh, feel what we are feeling, get the feel. Because when we talk about food as being a connector, it's an actual connector. Next slide, please. Uh, in the next slide, I'll be sharing, uh, these are resources on seeds. Uh, I hope uh, the participants will be able to learn from that. Uh, we have struggles for seeds of readiness and women autonomy in Kenya, how women struggle. What I want to also share is that as people go and buy the seeds from the agrovet, you cannot buy seeds alone. Many a times you have to buy them with the chemical fertilizers together. And nowadays they're even introducing some bugs that have chemicals that farmers are told buy this bag and, uh, and animals are not going to, uh, uh, you know, not animals, pests are not going to attack your, your harvested product. But what our indigenous uh, practices was using, for instance, ash, which you don't have to buy, was being used as a preservative. But because of the dominant narrative that you need to use chemicals and you need to adopt the so-called science, People are not using ash, which is cheap, which you can get when you, you know, you light a fire, you can actually get free ash. But now people are, are being trained to aggravate, to continue buying seeds and continue buying chemicals. And in the process, continue to increase the market share of the Monsantos and Sigentas of this world. Next slide, please. Uh, still, it's uh, resource material. Uh, one is capitalism. Did not cause the uh, food uh, capitalism was the cause of the food crisis and not um, and not Putin because the capitalist system actually perpetuates the insecurity, the food insecurity that we have in the world. And these are some of the uh, on the ground experiences that we have as an organization uh, that you can learn from and you can share. And of course, I'd like to say thank you very much for this opportunity to share our own the ground reality. Looking forward to the questions. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, Leonida. A very comprehensive analysis of what's happening um, um, on, on the continent of Africa. I just shared all the materials that uh, Leonida, the resources in the chat. So please do copy and, and uh, add them because I'm not sure if it's gonna be there after um, uh, for folks to use. I would like to also introduce our next speaker, uh, Julia Nawira, if I got it right, Nawira Komu, is a trained expert in agribusiness, sea production and rural issues, as well as a young organic vegetable farmer, a seed saver, and a businesswoman and a new mother. Congratulations. She is a deputy team leader at Seed Savers Network in Kenya, as well as the gender and agroecology agroecology market specialist. Sea Savers Network is a network of farmers with 70% women and 30% of men of all ages. Their mission is to conserve agrobiodiversity by strengthening community sea system for improved food and nutritional security and sovereignty. Julia's work focuses on women's empowerment in areas of agricultural business, enter enterprise development, value addition, and social and personal development. Thank you so much, Julia. Thank you. Thank you, Ama, for that introduction. Um, hi, everyone. It's a pleasure to be in this panel to share also my our experiences and our work that we are doing. Thank you to Leonida and Tiffany for the amazing presentations, a lot of learning as well. So I would like to also share what we are doing at Seed Savers Network Kenya. Um, so as the introduction was done, I work at Seed Savers as the head of programs, gender and agroecology. 
And I would like also to introduce what seed savers is apart from what Ama shared. So we conserve our global diversity through seed saving from our name. Uh, we are a network of farmers. We work with uh, farmer groups, registered farmer groups, and also we our work mainly is centered around community seed banking. We are a civil society organization, and so far we have the network has over sixty six thousand farmers. Uh, our vision is to be the leading agent on seed access. So, growing up uh, personally, I grew up from a small scale family, and in in my home, I found my family growing uh, pyrethrum in the farms. So mostly what that means was contract farming. And you would find there would be instances where my family would have to go and buy food. So this is the plight of many small scale farmers where they have land, but uh, somehow they go for contract farming to be able to, they feel like they want cash in their pockets and uh, then they end up having this money to go back and buy food. So this is a gap we are trying to close as an organization also. And through this, I've been also able to work with my community and change this kind of perception and uh, sensitize farmers because mostly you find sometimes with the the media, the capture where what my colleague Leonida was talking about, you find what is always being shared on media has great influence on people. And so you find they are living what they they know they were producing and it was beneficial and they are following the masses. So if everyone is growing white maize, you find farmers are forgetting their colored traditional indigenous foods and they are going with what everyone else is doing. So we are countering this uh, as an organization. Uh, so uh, also mostly why we exist apart from that is on our sovereignty of food. And my colleague Leonida covered much of that. So really we are ex we are importing a lot of our seeds like for example for vegetable seeds currently in Kenya we are importing 95% of uh vegetables they are exotic vegetables so what that means is we are forgetting our indigenous foods our indigenous vegetables and so we come in to ensure that communities are reminded that this is important, this is nutritious enough. So also on issues of uh, diversity loss, I remember Tiffany sharing her story on losing diversity and all, and this is the, also the same case that is happening here. And also Kenya, we've been having challenges on food safety, where you find, uh, going to a show like what uh, Leonida mentioned on uh, us uh, here in Kenya, you find farmers are over spraying their, their, their produce in their farms because of our regulations. It's, it's not stringent enough. Yet for export market, you find there's, there are those stringent measures being followed and government is taking um, a, a lot of work to inspect and do all the work. But when it comes to locally, there is a big challenge and our food is no longer safe. And so that's why we have moved to agroecology farming. Uh, farmers tell you of stories of how their family members are uh, have been hit by cancer, a lot of cancer cases, and this is mainly uh, related to what we are consuming now, which is a sad state. And we are coming into capacity build, and also we capacity build with a participatory way with the farmers because they have this indigenous knowledge. So it's a sharing moment, what is working, what is not working, 
how can we ensure we have zero budget kind of farming so what we are saying is no external inputs we should be able to be fully independent as a farmer producing from your own farm using locally available materials uh, so mostly our work we do capacity building this is our training center seed savers we have demo farms uh, we have capacities to hold farmers from all over kenya it's a grassroots organization that's able to reach farmers we use a lead farmer model where we have women coming they get trained and they are able to train women who are not able to in their own villages they get this capacity and they continue the work they are doing so um, mostly today i wanted to share about women as custodians of seed and what that really entails in detail. So women uh, being custodian of seed is uh, a long process, a noble work, noble and tedious work. And it starts from the very, uh, from when you are planting your crop, so that is where the seed, uh, the seed work starts from the very beginning. So uh, before we can get a final seed, women uh, grow the. They start with the crop in the farm. So the pictures you are seeing, these are women scouting the crops when they are very young. They have to mark the ones that are growing strong, the ones that they they are not being attacked by any kind of pest or disease and they walk with the crop and they walk the journey with the with this crop so every time they have to go to the farm they inspect and they see how the crops are they put some ribbons uh, to mark the crops that are growing strong and they are stable they don't have any attacks so these are what will be expected to be the seeds that will be harvested. So when the farmers have gone through the process, they have done the scouting. Now, if the crops are ready, they go again. You can see farmers, mostly women, carrying their children, doing this work as they care for their children. They are going to harvest uh, tomatoes. These are tomatoes on my father uh, left so uh, the work of uh, seed production is long so this is uh, farmers collecting the tomatoes there is also the work of cleaning harvesting uh, so uh, so after farmers have taken the the tomatoes from the farm the next step is uh extracting extracting seeds from the tomatoes which is a, a tedious process it's a lengthy process but it is noble work and also it is work that they it it is work that gives them um the independence in 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 their own food production because for example right now five gram or 10 gram of uh, tomato seed is extremely expensive it's over 25 uh, us dollars so that is amount that farmers are not able to afford but through this process of uh, learning on seed production they are able to continue uh, nourishing their families with food by ensuring like they have tomatoes on their plates and they can even get uh, most of that also to the market. So the pictures you see also is uh, extraction of different uh, seeds. This picture at the center is uh, farmers extracting purple seeds. So you find uh, they don't have to go back to, to the market to buy even uh, seeds for growing their own fruits. They can easily buy a fruit, or uh, get a fruit from another farmer exchange and be able to 
to get to extract seed and grow seed grow the seed to to have fruits in their own farms so the photos on my further right these are farmers cleaning seeds so seed work is a work that women do and uh, women when we say women are the custodians of seed this is what it entails the whole process of uh following through the crop uh choosing the the crop that is uh, most resilient that is the strongest from the others extracting cleaning the seed and finally uh what you see at the bottom here these are tomato seeds they they are putting them for two to three days for them to ferment so that they can uh have when they uh clean that water they are able to remove the fleshy part of the tomato and remain with the correct tomato seeds so uh after this women go on to to dry the seeds under shade after they dry the seeds under shade they can then keep these seeds for the next planting season so you find that women um are mostly the guardians of our food system they ensure that diversity of food is there because mostly women are concerned with the nutrition of their houses of their homes so apart from just uh, this kind of uh they they also they have skills on how to do vegetables vegetable seeds and vegetable seeds are really expensive so it's not something farmers are able to afford and so the skill to be able to produce which is something they know so seed saving is an indigenous culture that has that communities have been doing and it's not a new concept but because of um uh the continuous capture and uh, the insistent on certified seed it it uh it makes farmers to think that maybe their seeds are not viable enough their seeds are not good but this is what has been uh, uh feeding communities has been nourishing nourishing their families for years and years so of course we know multinationals what they are trying to do is create that dependency kind of situation but uh with communities being sensitized on the importance and the work that they are doing uh we are seeing that this work uh is able to continue safeguarding and conserving our agrobiodiversity because uh, as an organization we did an analysis a diversity analysis in a village in nakuru nakuru is a one is a city in kenya so we did uh a diversity analysis around Nakuru area, the rural parts, and we found out that 35, uh, we documented 35 uh, lost varieties of different crops. So you can imagine, and this was only one village, and they had lost so many different varieties, they, they were not able to trace them. They were talking of, we used to see this kind of beans. They were this color and this we no longer see them so that is the that is a major gap that communities are able to change and this is being done mostly by women so women are playing a very big role as uh, seed custodians in the seed banks so before i talk about uh, seed banks I still want to talk about the seed work that women do. So the pictures you see, these are women regenerating seeds. Uh, this is millet, millet seeds that women had planted closely, just as seed and not food. So the women are the ones who are doing this work. They have the capacity and eventually the idea is to be able to have 
to have seed enterprises for women where they are able to to con to provide access of these new uh, indigenous seeds Exam for example millet is a bit underutilized crop in Kenya where most people are only eating maize but millet is a great alternative mixed with uh, sorghum and it's very nutritious so this is the work women are doing so um, as an organization we are working closely with women in a participatory characterization process where women are understanding different varieties how they look so we are doing this uh, the pictures that I've, uh, I'm showing here we did a diversity assessment for example of beans and we we ask farmers to share in their own indigenous knowledge of all the varieties of beans they have in a specific community and then together with with the in in their own groups they grow all these varieties so they want to be able to understand the characteristics of these beans in terms of how they grow what is the the shape of the leaf of this variety up, up until they get the seed so we feel that this this work is very important so that women can continue to uh, do the work and grow and be able to distinguish the seeds that they have the crops that they have in terms of uh, varieties so you find that farmers so we have developed simple descriptors so descriptors mostly is used to register varieties of seeds but as a grassroots organization we have uh, developed simple descriptors of these crops so these are key crops from a baseline that we did in the community where farmers uh, provided details of the key crops that they are working with that they grow in their communities so with that we we developed uh, uh, descriptors simple descriptors in a participatory way with the knowledge of what farmers understand what is easy for them do they understand what a pod is we also translate to our own language Swahili and so we do the descriptor with them the photo you see on my further right these are farmers uh, doing a characterization of african black nightshade so this is a, a leafy vegetable that we eat uh, we eat as a leafy vegetable and it's very popular in kenya so we realized the african uh, black nightshade was getting uh, we were losing the indigenous variety and you find that we were we are relying mostly on exotic imported variety so it was upon us to be able to conserve the indigenous ones that we have so this process was farmers uh, planted five varieties of black nightshade and they are describing how each of the five they are different from each other what is the shape of this uh, leaf of what is the color or the size of the seed eventually because through this process they are able to go up to the seed uh, seed production of these uh, crops so you find that uh, seed work is is done by women women are the ones organized well in groups they are the ones dedicated to the entire work of walking the journey of uh, of crops it's like raising a baby it's the same as raising a child where you need patience you need to uh, tender for the crop until you get the seed so uh, as the work uh, goes so women also do seed festivals to also ensure there is uh, seed access for other other people that don't have this the community seed banks so seed festivals we we have seed festivals annually two two in a year so kenya we have two planting seasons we have the long rains that are around this time 
March, April, these are the long rains. And then around October, November there, we have our short rains. So we always do seed fairs with farm. We work with farmers where we do seed, seed festivals. And we had the seed festival this year on 8th of March. And farmers, 8th of March is also International Women's Day. And so this was very essential to because to, to be able to celebrate women on the work they are doing with seed, the work they are doing to conserve the, our diversity. And mostly because the, the, the seeds that women grow, they are, they are, we have a variety of potato seed in Kenya, which is which they call Deramwana. Deramwana is a local language that means raising children. So there is a potato particularly named raising children. So you can see to what extent the varieties and the food and the crops that uh, women uh, keep and grow, they are really to be able to nourish and raise their families. And in that, they are able to conserve agrobiodiversity. Uh, and so maybe mostly what we need to do is to recognize the work that uh, indigenous rural women are doing with seeds and they need more support to be able to continue with this work, especially capacity building, uh, also support in terms of their community seed banks, which I will show a picture of the seed banks. But apart from uh, just showcasing their seeds, these seed fairs and festivals, they are also platforms for uh, sharing information with farmers within themselves also as farmers. They, they create very nice uh, skits where they play and they, they dance. They, they, it's a cultural celebration. And maybe later, as I as as I proceed, I'll talk about our laws and how they limit the the cultural uh, practices which are allowed by the constitution. But yet we have policies that restrict the exchange. So these seed fairs that we do, it's also a platform for exchanging the seeds. And farmers are able to get varieties that they don't have. They are able to get from other community seed banks that have them. And so in that way, communities continue to have diversity. And we continue to soldier on in terms of conserving the diversity and um, sensitizing each other about why we should continue doing this work. So apart from just uh, showcasing their seeds, the festivals also, um, it's a, a platform to, to make food, indigenous food. So you find we have youths coming and because of that gap that is there with indigenous knowledge and also in terms of food, there's, it's an opportunity for learning where, where youths also learn on how to make different uh, seeds where communities uh, bring their own different ways of making food. So it's a seed and food festival where we celebrate our indigenous foods and our indigenous uh, seeds. So also, as I proceed, this is just a snippet of how community seed banks look. And they are mostly the women are the ones. They are the ones uh, keeping the seeds. They are the ones looking after the seed banks. So this this is how seed banks mostly look. They have containers where they put their seeds. So just like a bank, the idea of the seed bank is to to get loan. So you can get loans, uh, seed loans, and then and then you return with interest. So what that means is if uh, somebody from the community uh, knows this group or a member of our group uh, doesn't have certain vegetable seeds, they can come to the seed bank and ask for maybe one spoon, like 10 grams of uh, vegetable seed. 
and they are required to bring two two spoons of the vegetable once they once they harvest so that is the idea of the seed banks to also ensure there is capacity of each of the member to produce seed and to also ensure they keep for the next season so uh, women also use uh, traditional methods of preserving the seeds uh, Leonida mentioned ash so mostly ash is what women use and this is readily available in their kitchen as they cook so they have a bit of uh, ash and this is what they mix with their grains and the the seeds can always withstand any they are not able to be attacked by any weevils any external thing up to the next planting season so we you find that mostly the there's the preservation methods are what farmers have been using for years and years and it was just a reminder like this you have you you are using the smoking method and this actually works so what we are saying is that also indigenous farmers knowledge needs to be recognized and not really sidelined from scientific we should not always have a case where it it is counterchecked with scientific because it as as it's uh, as indigenous knowledge in itself it is a standalone it can defend itself it's able to it has been working for years and years and so it should be recognized the same way scientific uh, research is because the farms and what farmers have been doing has been working and what I'm, i mean is that the two can coexist they can uh, borrow from each other and appreciate each other's strength without sidelining one so mostly all this work is indigenous knowledge uh, farmers my my grandparents used to keep uh seeds for the next planting it was not always going to the shop to buy any kind of input so this is what we are saying and we are reminding communities that whatever you used to do it is okay it is noble it is something that you should continue doing so uh seed banks mostly you find the community seed banks how they work you the every community serves every community seed bank serves around a hundred people and in a bit of a household uh, exchange so um the the idea that we we are going through is to be able to ensure this community seed bank are sustainable and that farmers continue to keep them and we can only do this by uh empowering farmers to be able to get an opportunity to sell these seeds with our laws but we where we are working on ensuring we change the policies and and farmer managed system are recognized and farmers can be able to get income so this work needs more support and we want to appreciate uh seed change seed change is our partner in this work we've been working together to uh, in a project called Rural Women Cultivating Change, where we are working closely with women in this work, where they learn on agroecology farming, leadership in their groups, and also to be able to voice out their, their issues, their concerns, and also share their indigenous knowledge with communities. So we want to appreciate seed change uh for this partnership so maybe before i conclude i wanted to share a bit of uh the kenyan seed loss a case of uh over grass in baringo so this is a story i that happened and it is also in port so the buffalo grass this is a grass growing in baringo baringo is in uh, rift valley of kenya baringo is quite dry so mostly the the people living in baringo are pastoralists so they have uh, their livestock and mostly they 
they keep livestock and also do beekeeping, all that kind of work. So what happened to the buffer grass and in, in relation to our Kenyan seed law is that uh, a foreigner came from another country and they settled in Baringo. They were doing their own work, foundation work. And in the process, they realized that this buffer grass is very, it's very, uh, in, it's a, a very strong, the word is like when uh, livestock feed on this uh, buffer grass, they are able to keep a lot of milk. So really as a grass is very commercially viable in terms of being able to get other people to access this buffer grass. And so what this person did, they decided to apply for plant breeders rights for this grass. So what our Kenyan uh, seed laws does is that it has given uh, plant breeders the right to discover variety. And my colleague Leonida explained more on how uh, you, you can register and say, this is my, my variety, but yet communities have been growing for years and years. And they know this, is gra this grass is uh, shared within the community. This is a community grass. Anyone can grow it, anyone can share. So what this person did, they applied for uh, plant breeders rights over this grass. And unfortunately or fortunately, they got the, they got the license and they became the owners of the, the buffalo grass. So what happened now, uh, they started contracting farmers to grow and they, they commercialized the grass. And then farmers realized that uh, they were being, uh, they were getting uh, warnings for arrest because they were now growing this grass, yet it belongs to somebody else. Other farmers were growing and selling, but that is because of the plant breeders' rights. This was only to be done by this person, or you pay patent. So that was what was happening. Uh, so now a few farmers were able to to come together, try to tried to protest. Unfortunately, they were not heard. Mostly, farmers' voices are not heard. But uh, what luckily what happened is that other interested parties within the government parastato were interested. Like the there's a Kerio Kenya. Uh, the KVDA, this is a parastato working around the Baringo area, was also interested in this grass. They wanted to also register it in a way uh, as an as a a commercial kind kind of uh, of grass. So they were able to go to court and counter this uh, plant breeder, right? So that was the only way the farmer was lucky enough to to be able to be heard. But also we, we have done publications around this also to be able to voice out and say what is happening. So that is the situation on biopiracy where our laws allow for, they, they give plant breeders rights over farmers rights. And so if you are able to discover a variety, you, you can own it. And so what we are, working around is having seeds as commons. And this is a project where we are trying through the characterization and documentation that I explained before, where farmers are doing simple uh, documentation of their varieties. We want all these indigenous varieties to be commons and registered as uh, open source seeds where communities can use open without having anyone owning them. Yeah. So that is what we are saying. No, that's that's so important, Julia. And the story you just shared about the buffalo grass is, it's just, you know, it sounds wild, but it's happening, I think, as folks said in the chat, right? It's, it's something that's happening uh, globally. 
Um, we want to make sure we have enough time for questions and answers uh, yes. from folks. So if you would like to pose your questions, please do. And I'll hand it over to, I think, Bea. Yeah, you're next. Yes, just to thank you, Julia, so much for that. It was uh, amazing. And for all the speakers as well, this has been uh, incredible. And uh, there's been some great discussion in the chat as well and lots of exchange of information and documentaries. That's really wonderful. So yes, yeah, so we have about um, 25 minutes for questions. And if people want to put put their hand up to uh, say your question, ask your question, or put it, there's a Q&A function at the bottom of your screen or in the chat. Uh, we'd love to have questions and discussion right now. And um, also, uh, as people are writing their questions or putting their hand up thinking um also to invite the panelists do you have a question for another panelist as well take this um this opportunity as well if you to to, to do that and i'll just uh butt in as well to say that um for those of you who signed in using the zoom link that we emailed out um you will see that you have been named sb rays um and so if you want to what you can do if you click over your name there's a drop down menu where you can rename yourself. And so if you do that, then you can type in your real name or another name that you wish to go by for the sake of today. And that way, if you raise your hand with the reaction function, we can unmute you and you actually can just speak with the panel instead of just putting your, your question in the chat or using the Q&A. So yeah, so Tiffany, Leonida, Luke, and Julie, if you have any kind of comments or reflections or questions for each other, we'd love to to just open this, start by opening the space to for you three. Okay, <clears throat> perhaps I can go first. Uh, I think the aspect of corporate capture is not only uh, something that is African, this is something that is uh, global. And of course, food is becoming a new frontier as far as uh, corporations are concerned. Uh, they are fighting for food, uh, they are fighting for carbon, through carbon capture. Because like in Kenya now, we are going to be, like in Kenya, we are going to change our climate change. We are going to have a change in our legislation, the Climate Change Act, uh, which is going to have laws covering uh, carbon markets. And of course, we know what carbon markets are bound to do to our food, are bound to do to our, our land. Because farmers are going to be pushed into carbon credit, something they don't, they don't even understand. And then after a short time, they are going to be told that the prices global prices have gone down and so uh, in a crash so uh, there's no security and uh, what i want to reinforce is the fact that uh, we need to have more spaces especially for capacity building as uh, my colleague uh, juliet said and uh, of course we need to create alternative spaces uh, when you have uh, where farmers can have their own feet where farmers can because if you have your own feet you sit in a seat you're actually not going to go to any agro vet to buy any seed. And of course, we also need to bring in the uh, elderly people in the spaces because these are actually uh, living libraries. And when they die, they actually die with a mammoth amount of it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Leonida. Um, any um, other questions? I, I have a question I could ask, but uh, I do want to uh, let other others ask. Um, but the question that, that I would have for the panelists um, is, uh, how do you see your work uh, as part of a broader food sovereignty movement? And what is perhaps areas where you would see the need for more recognition for your work uh, within that movement? Thank you. Can I respond? Yeah, and can we ask uh, you to just speak speak a little bit more into your microphone, Leonida? There's sound issues on your end. Uh, can you hear me now? Is it better? It's about the same. <laughs> no? no, it's actually worse. Okay, let me increase the volume. Maybe Julia can go next. Let Julia go first. Okay. Uh, so, um, 
Apologies, Beatrice, I think I missed part of it, but as an organization, or maybe you could just rephrase it quickly and then I can respond, sorry. Yeah, so how is uh, your connection to some uh, broader movements? And I know in your work, you're also connecting with women's rights movements. Uh, so what, how do you see your work as uh, guardians, uh, custodians of uh, seeds and diversity within either food movement or women's uh, rights movements, broader movements? And, and what, what would you need to be more supported, perhaps? Thank you. Thank you for such. Uh, thank you. So as an organization, we are also working with the other movements. There is Root to Food movement. We are part of that. Uh, African Biodiversity Network, we are also part of that. And so we are working with other like-minded uh, organizations to continue the work. And uh, though also mostly we would need support to work with other like currently the project we are working on we are working with tanzania and ethiopia the rural women cultivating change project but we feel we've been having uh people asking us on exchange visits to even uh rwanda uganda for this work so i think we could have exchange visits to learn from what others are doing, what farmers do, how they do their traditional preservation of seeds, and that kind of knowledge exchange to be able to advance the women capacity on seed and also learn on how they can continue with community seed banking also, where others maybe have succeeded, the challenges they've had. Yeah. Thank you very much. And there's a question in the in the question and answer um, asking about um, Julia about uh, speaking a bit more on grassroots efforts to inform and engage farmers in what is happening on seed laws. Um. I was trying to read the question. Is it the question? Can you speak more a bit on the grassroots efforts to inform and engage farmers in what is happening on seed loss? Uh, all right. So what we are doing, we we have uh, effort. So what we are doing, we do using the seed ambassador model. So seed ambassador model means uh, farmer leaders. So farmers mostly are capacity built to know about their rights, to understand about the seed loss. And they go back to their villages, their communities, where they, they hold community trainings and they, with their own simple language, they are able to make farmers also understand their rights and what is happening around the seed loss, the extent they can go in exchanging seeds or in selling seeds. So this is happening. These are the efforts we are doing by ensuring the work is able to reach more and more farmers in the communities through this model. Yeah. So that is what we are doing. Okay. Can I come next? <clears throat> Can I say something? Absolutely. Okay. Okay, for Hakinawiri, from our perspective, one is that uh, some of the challenges or sort of support that uh, we're looking at is uh, support to be able to build capacity of more farmers. Uh, we are a new organization. We just were founded in 2020 in the wake of COVID. So you can uh, try to imagine how challenging it was even to operate. Uh, we're looking forward, for example, to have uh, more uh, partnerships in terms of implementation of projects. We are looking forward to have as many seed banks as my colleague uh, Julia have in the different communities. We have 47 counties in Kenya, and as we have, we have so many smallholder farmers who do not who have not been reached with the knowledge and with the skills. And uh, for example, for us, we are working with a group of a network of women, 300 women in one locality in a place called Machakos. But unfortunately, we've also only been able to train 20 of them due to resource constraints, 20 of them on agroecology. So we actually have a large group of women who are 
still in dire need of uh, capacity building and also uh, uh, training in terms of learning about seeds and agroecology and all that. Uh, the other thing I want to point out, for example, for us as an organization, we are uh, utilizing uh, spaces such as social media to amplify our work and share the knowledge that we have. We normally organize what we call uh, online dialogue, like the one I shared on feminist alternative, and we use these as spaces for sharing uh, the on the ground work. But we find that not everyone can access uh, internet because we have some Maybe people in the village who don't even have access to electricity, live alone access to um, to the garden. Uh, we are also doing uh, some engagements through the Alliance of Interrenic in Africa. Uh, seed working uh, issues around seeds, for example, uh, participating in policy processes, and that's where now, for example, we get information on what the African Union is planning as far as the seed within the continent is concerned. And uh, we also, uh, for example, engage with the uh, um, uh, African group of negotiators where sometimes we get invited to bring on board the on the ground experiences, for instance, of climate crisis and food related issues as far as women are concerned. And then within the civil society and indigenous people's mechanism, uh, 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 within the Committee on World Food Security, I participate uh, in the negotiation processes, particularly bringing the African realities to that space, and of course, ch challenging the existing narratives as far as uh, what is in the continent is concerned. So actually participate in bringing the African voices, sometimes you find that due to financial constraints, you, can, you may not be able to go and participate physically in these negotiations. Uh, and so we take advantage of online spaces, for example, to participate and bring on board our, our issues. Uh, the other gap that I feel that uh, could be supported is working with young people, especially on agroecology, because in the African continent, we find that uh, agriculture is left to the elderly people. And as I said, when they pass on, they're actually passing on with a lot of knowledge. So perhaps projects that can work with young people in, on, in terms of agroecology can be very, very uh, powerful. If I'm to share uh, one uh, activity that we had with young people during the 16 days of global action on agroecology, we found a lot of gaps. Uh, young people are espousing uh, conventional agriculture. When you ask them what becoming the type of food you eat, they tell you, when I have money, I go to KFC. When I have less money, that's when I cook food. And so that's where we had uh, you know, conversations around uh, food justice, food sovereignty, and why it's important to be aware of where your food comes from, and also consumer engagement, because in, we had an incident where uh, meat in the supermarkets were being laced with uh, formalin that is used to preserve dead bodies. So when we educate people, for example, about the relevance of uh, knowing where their food comes from through organizing community dialogue, this can be very powerful. So for us, we're looking at uh, whether we can get partners to work with us, especially in because we work with university students across Kenya, Uganda, and Tanzania, this can be a very big opportunity to change the narrative and the mindset of, of young people to adopt agroecology and uh, a seed saving mechanism, for example, what uh, has been presented by my colleague. Thank you very much. Thanks so much for that, Leonida. Um, I have a question. So I'm thinking, Tiffany, about what you were talking about in your um, at the beginning, you were talking about how it's really women and femme and two-spirit growers who are leading this, this food sovereignty, this indigenous food sovereignty movement, and this movement to revitalize indigenous foodways and to defend them in the face of colonial and, and corporate forces. And Leonida and Julia, we saw the important role that women are playing in the work that you're doing. And I'm wondering if you all can speak a little bit more explicitly to the, like, to why women are taking up these roles? Why is it that women are leaders in these in these movements? And to talk a little bit more about the relationship between women's empowerment and agroecology and food sovereignty, because you know, on the one hand, you know, I think I think it was Julia you were talking about or Leonid about the the kind of seductive power of white maize and the way that um, fertilizers and Roundup are kind of marketed as these sort of not only more modern. Um, and more fancy ways to grow, but they're also labor saving, 
right? And so you're also talking, Julie, about the toil and the honorable work that's involved in, in being a seed custodian, but also about the real important role that seeds play as, as integral to traditional cultures or to indigenous cultures. So can you talk a little bit more explicitly about why women are playing these leadership roles, why women in Two-Spirit and Femme are playing these leadership roles and what the relationship between women's empowerment and, and agroecology is? Maybe I okay. can go first. Okay, you can go first, Julia. All right, thank you. Um, so you find in the community mostly why women are taking this uh, lead, leading role is uh, you find uh, we've been trying to also get men involved, but you find men are mostly just interested with uh, monocropping and just doing commercial kind of agriculture. So you find within our cultural setting, women are mostly have taken the lead in terms of uh, food and nutrition care for the homes. So it's more like a traditional role that women have on uh, ensuring there is food and preparing food. So in extension, that goes also to uh, putting in the work on making sure maybe uh, I have diverse vegetables in the farm for my family. So you find uh, it's unfortunate that this role mostly is has been left to women and men have uh, mostly adapted the role of uh, they somehow in I put in quotes like they are more they are putting like their bigger provider so they want to to do massive land and one crop so that they can get to the market but in essence this uh we are seeing men also trying to embrace a bit of that and uh, the, a bit of now agroecology and diversity because they are seeing you find the men want the side that the women have put aside in their plates in the evening but they have a side of the farm for for commercial so this is the dynamic that is happening uh in the homes and in culture but women have taken role because it's a cultural uh practice but also because the work uh is requires patience and requires that kind of nurturing aspect that women have so uh being able to empower women in agroecology is important because through that they are able to as they raise their children they are also able to get income as they do what they because agroecology comes to women easily because it's something they they want to do for their family so if they can be able to get income by doing that it's very important to ensure they are empowered economically they are able to value add their produce for the market wonderful tiffany and meet there yeah um i guess like from from my context here i think um a lot of this has to do with the fact that um when settlers came, you know, it was less than 200 years ago, they were sold this, you know, American slash Canadian dream where they would be able to come here, own large swaths of land um, and, and get in on that ground floor of, of capitalism. And, and it's always about, it's always been about money. Um, and I think that was basically what the governments um, sold to, um, you know, heads of household being, you know, predominantly men. And that when they came here, they could just be gifted land. Um, you know, they could grow whatever they wanted. And, you know, then obviously we see how that's gone from maybe like, you know, cereal and grain crops into what we're now seeing as the commodity commodity uh, crops, um, predominantly here where I'm living, it's canola. Um, and of course, like, you know, uh, we've all been talking about, you know, Roundup Ready crops um, that basically get people sucked in and then they're stuck. So then they have to continually keep buying seed, keep buying fertilizers um, and herbicides um, that just keep fueling that machine um, all the while stripping, um, stripping the soil. And women just have predominantly um, 
been the caretakers, whether that's the caretakers of land, children, seeds, food. Um, that is just, it's always been our role, especially as Indigenous people um, here in Turtle Island. Um, and yeah, it was interesting, you know, I, I was, you know, seeing about the Julia talking about, you know, the beautiful work with sharing seed and having these festivals of seed where they can, you know, you know, freely be able to, to share food and seed and knowledge. You know, that, that's something, that's another thing that's been kind of, that we've been cut off from here on Turtle Island is the colonial border, you know, the medicine line where um, a lot of our nations span right through that imaginary line. Um, and now we're being stuck where we can't be trading across that border um, with our kin. I mean, these are our families, these are our relatives. Um, and to be able to have those, what we call grease trails and, you know, our trade routes reestablished is something that um, I'd like to see in my lifetime. Um, but uh, I, I always dream big. So I, I just think that's really beautiful. I just wanted to say that I, I really appreciate the work that both of you are doing um, in your communities. I think it's it's such a, a, a wonderful dream and it's it takes, I think it takes the strength of, of women in community to be doing this work, to have that hope um, and curiosity and be able to push you know this work forward. So deep respect to both of you. Uh, <clears throat> Just to make a short contribution in the relationship between women uh, empowerment and agroecology, one I want to point out that uh, within the African continent, we can't say that agroecology is something new. Uh, we've been practicing agroecology as our way, way of life, but now it, we are bringing it back because the dominant narrative that our food production is at age, food production is not working, is why we are amplifying agroecology that we need to go back to our practices that were actually ensuring that uh, our parents are staying for even a hundred years, something that hardly happens anymore. So uh, one thing I want to also say is that agroecology is a science. It's a movement, it's also a practice. Women adopt agroecology more because women are more, I can say more organized. You find them, for example, in Kenya, we have things called chama. Chama means coming together to pull resources. So you find that women can come together, start producing food, organize how this food is going to be sold. So it makes it easier to organize them as, as a group based on, on their gender. Uh, the other thing is that uh, the bulk of food production in, in our continent is often done by women. They're responsible for the uh, unpaid care work within the housing setting, but they're also responsible for other economic activities at the household level. You'll find that it's women who, who are when there's no food, they're the ones who are being asked where is the food. Many a times men are never asked where the food is. They are, are charged with uh, uh, preparation of food, they are charged with uh, cooking, nurturing uh, family members, taking care of the land. And even if you look at uh, uh, agricultural production, the bulk of those who work in the agricultural value chain are often women. And this now brings in the aspect, the importance and relevance of agroecology, because as I said, the structural adjustment program within the African continent uh, really deprived us of the essential services by government, because before, before the 1970s structural uh, adjustment program, services used to be provided by government, but now government is not providing us with any service. And this is part of the reason why women have to play a larger, uh, a more difficult uh, uh, role, engage more in manual labor because for you even to get a government, first of all, the services are non-existent in many places. And where they, in places where they are, they'll tell you that if you go asking for a government official, they'll ask you, they'll tell you the car doesn't have fuel, so you have to pay for the fuel. When they come to your land to look at your animals or to look at your crops, they're not going to leave that place without giving some money. And that's why now we are saying that when we are able to train, for example, alternative uh, uh, agricultural service providers who have been trained on agroecology, they can actually provide and place in the community, they can actually be able to share this information with the communities. And they, the community members don't have to travel distances to the government offices to get the uh, much needed service. Mm -hmm. uh, another thing when we're talking about uh, food sovereignty within the agroecology, Circles, we push not for food security because, for example, right now there can be food in a supermarket. But if I don't have money in my pocket, if I go to the supermarket and grab that food, I'm going to be arrested. Yes, the food is there, 
but I don't have the power to control and I don't have the power to use that too. Another thing that uh, really comes out as very important is the aspect of controlling of uh, natural resources that can be used in food production, one of which is land. We find that many times, uh, sometimes women do not control, in many countries, in Kenya, for example, only 3% of women have uh, title, joint titles with their husband. That means that out of 50 million people, so many women do not control the land. And for example, if you want to do serious uh, food production, you'll need money. And if your name is not on that title deed, it means that you cannot go to the bank to get uh, any loan because the bank will ask, the bank will look at the uh, title deed and if your name does not appear there, it means that you don't have a stake in as far as that land is concerned. Uh, there, the, there are existing challenges, for example, due to patriarchy and cultural notions of control of natural resources. We find that in some communities, for example, pastoralist communities, women are not really allowed to uh, till land. You have to ask for permission from your husband. And this curtails how you produce the amount of food that you can be able to produce. Mm -hmm. And as uh, my colleague already said, you find that uh, women mostly control, um, you know, food crops while men control cash crops. And even if you look at livestock, you'll find that women only control like things like chicken, while men control things like cattle. And if you go to the market, you find that the price, buying price of chicken compared to a cow is very, very, uh, there's a big difference in terms mm -hmm. of it. Mm -hmm. But what I can say is that through agroecology, we can be able to address the gender disparities, especially through bringing both men and women together, having gender analysis sessions, for example, uh, asking men to, have a, uh, to, to share in a 24-hour clock what are the activities that they do, and then comparing this with the, what the activities that women do, and then challenging the men, start giving uh, opportunities to women, start uh, challenging men to help women, for example, uh, till the land, because sometimes when you talk to men, they'll tell you that uh, they go and stay at the shopping centers and tell mm -hmm. stories, you know, just hang out there with friends. But women never get that time to sit and hang out with friends. If you if you go to a, a farming community, you'll find that women are the one, last ones to sleep, they're the last ones to eat, they're the earliest ones to wake up, you know, and the whole day they never get time to rest. So through agroecological practices, we challenge this patriarchal society, we challenge men to start allowing for joint titling. And of course, we also encourage uh, young people to start owning land because you find that many a times young people only own land when the parents have died. Because in Africa, many African uh, societies, land is passed on from one person to the other. So you have to wait. If you want to fill the land, you have to get permission from your parents uh, for you to be able to fill that land. So agroecology, I think, uh, comes in to address, for example, even gender based violence because it enables women to have to be able to control their food, to be able to produce, to be able to take food to the market, and be able to have money in their pockets. And when women have money, it actually addresses the WBC file. Okay, thanks so much for that, Leonida. Um, I know that we're past time, um, so I, I, want, I don't know whether we can just, do we have time for one more question? I'm going to, I'll throw it out and maybe we can just very quickly speak to it. Um, we have a question from uh, Fabio Oliveira, who's asking about biopiracy um, in the current sort of neo-colonial and capitalist context, and whether you're seeing a new wave of biopiracy um, in terms of seeds in regions in the global south. Um, I mean, I guess we're talking about Africa um, in terms of the work that you're both engaged with in Kenya, um, but um, I think Fabio is also seeing some parallels in South, in South America. So just briefly, um, biopiracy, and is there a new wave of it that's, that's happening right now in terms of seeds? Uh, can, can I respond? Yes. Yes, uh, biopiracy is happening. And what I can say is one, is being done through the legislation. For example, when they talk about harmonization of seed laws. And as they harmonize these seed laws, what is happening is that they are not repealing the punitive clauses that exist within these laws. What do I mean when I say punitive clauses? These are those clauses that say that uh, if you exchange seeds, you can be arrested. Uh, a government inspector can come to your land to find out where the seeds you are using are come from. Uh, you have to register as a, as a farmer so that the government 
for you to get any government services. Uh, this creates uh, an environment where seed piracy can, can easily happen. And my other question is where do they, like for example, if they want to come up with new varieties of seeds, there is no other place that they get the seeds apart from the farmers, indigenous varieties. And what happens, they take them to lab, they alter them, and then after altering, what they do is they insert something called terminator gene. And what does this terminator gene do? It means that this seed has a lifespan and the farmer is not going to re, uh, you know, replant the seed. And what does that do? That means that the farmer has to be chained to the agrovet. I, I can just share one example in a, in a village in Machakos, a place called Bubuti, where we work. The entire village bought seeds from the local agrovet and they were told that uh, if the seeds don't start germinating, they should call a number. They were given a number to call and assured that uh, uh, in case of anything, they're going to be compensated. So when the seed didn't do any germination, what happened was when they called the number, the response was the mobile subscriber cannot be reached. So what does that mean to an African mother who is stealing land using manual labor, who does not have mechanized farming, who's depending on rain-fed agriculture, and you are not sure of when it's going to rain again. So when you say biopiracy, bio it's still happening through the legislation. It's also happening through the uh, push for biotech. We're seeing our countries are, are saying that when you adopt GM, uh, GM seeds is going to address food insecurity. And with the GM seeds, of course, they, they take the original seeds from the African uh, seed. And then after taking these original seeds, they go to the lab and convert the seeds. And of course, they have the patents. And they've ensured that the patents are taking as many years as between 20 to 25 years. So imagine 20 to 25 years when you are paying royalty in terms of taxes to somebody who stole your own seed in order to come up with this, the so-called uh, uh, the, the new variety. There's nothing new about their varieties. They've actually stolen the seed from the indigenous varieties of the farmer. And of course, there's also an aspect of um, control of genetic material, uh, genetic materials and benefit sharing. For example, in Kenya, you have the Genetic uh, Materials and Benefit Sharing Act, but you find that uh, for you to uh, participate, you, you must have uh, some sort of a certificate, which is very expensive. How many farmers can be able to afford to have a certificate in order to collect the genetic material? So that is Thank also so another much. way of yeah. biopiracy. Yes. Thank you so much, Leonida. <laughs> Okay. I'm just I'm I'm aware, I'm aware of how much we've gone over time, so I just I'm gonna I'm gonna just bring you and Tiff. I just want to also recognize what you're saying here in terms of the way that you're seeing uh, this playing out, um, biopiracy playing out in terms of native plants, so-called native plants or indigenous plants here in so-called Canada. Do you want to just take one minute before we close our closing thought? Yeah, I mean, I wrote it in the chat. I won't take up too much more time. I do have to run to another meeting as well. And I'm sure we all do. Um, yeah, just seeing seeing the level of um, erasure and biopiracy that's happening um, here at you know a level that's local to myself, and um, seeing that in native plant restoration work, um, as well as you know this, um, we're getting more and more people that are wanting to um, bring native species into their home gardens and into their farms, which is amazing. Um, but it's that whole take, 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 and what are we giving back? Um, so unless people are actually um, properly stewarding these species and seeds and growing them themselves and then sharing those seeds out, we're, we're still going to be losing, um, uh, we're losing biodiversity at a, an alarming rate. Um, and then that obviously, uh, you know, I should say like the shit rolls downhill, like it literally does, because now we're getting the, that the pollinators and the birds and the other keystone species are being impacted um, by that. And it's just exasperating, um, you know, the the climate chaos that's happening here in so-called Canada. Okay. okay. Thank you so much for that, Tiffany. Thank you, Julia. Thank you, Leonida.